philosophy, as in most other fields of human activity, the merits of the living are much more controversial than those of the dead. If you took a worldwide poll today among professors of philosophy on the question, who is the best living philosopher, I'm pretty sure no candidate would get an overall majority. So any list of the so-called great philosophers can only end with the latest of the generally acknowledged dead. And today, for us, that is Wittgenstein. Ludwig Wittgenstein was born in Vienna in 1889. His father, from whom he was to inherit a fortune, was the biggest steel magnate in Austria. Wittgenstein was fascinated by machinery from boyhood, and his education was strongly weighted in the direction of mathematics, physics, and engineering. After studying mechanical engineering in Berlin, he spent three years at Manchester University as a postgraduate student in aeronautics. During this period, he became absorbed in fundamental questions about the nature of mathematics. Bertrand Russell's book, The Principles of Mathematics, inspired him to give up engineering and go to Cambridge to study the philosophy of mathematics under Russell himself. He soon learned all that Russell had to teach and went on to do the original research that was to produce his first book, the Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus, published in 1921 and usually referred to just as the Tractatus. Wittgenstein genuinely believed that in this book he had solved the fundamental problems of philosophy. So he turned away from philosophy and did other things. Meanwhile, the Tractatus acquired enormous influence, stimulating further developments in logic at Cambridge and on the continent becoming the most admired text among the famous group of logical positivists known as the Vienna Circle. But Wittgenstein himself came to feel that it was fundamentally in error. So he went back to doing philosophy after all. In 1929, he returned to Cambridge, where in 1939, he became professor of philosophy. During this second period at Cambridge, he developed a completely new approach, quite different from his earlier one. During the rest of his life, its influence spread only through personal contact, since, apart from one very brief article, he published nothing more before his death in 1951. However, in 1953, his book, Philosophical Investigations came out posthumously and proved to be the most influential work of philosophy that's appeared since the Second World War, at least in the English-speaking world. So here we have a most remarkable phenomenon, a philosopher of genius producing two incompatible philosophies at different stages of his life, each of which influenced a whole generation. These two philosophies, although incompatible, do have some basic features in common. Both are focused on the role of language in human thinking and human life, and both are centrally concerned to demarcate between valid and invalid uses of language, or as someone once put it, to draw the lines at which sense ends and nonsense begins. For me, the earlier of Wittgenstein's two main books, The Tractatus, remains hauntingly readable. But it has to be said that it's the later one, the philosophical investigations, that has made him a cultural figure of international significance during the period since his death. Here to discuss Wittgenstein's work with me is John Searle, Professor of Philosophy at the University of California in Berkeley. Professor Searle, since Wittgenstein himself repudiated his early philosophy, and since in any case it's now the later philosophy that's far and away the more influential, I don't think we ought to spend too much of our discussion on the early work. What is it about that that we really need to know? Well, I think the key to understanding the Tractatus is the picture theory of meaning. Uh, Wittgenstein felt that if language was to represent reality, if sentences were to represent states of affairs, then there had to be something in common between the sentence and the state of affairs. And he saw the way to describe that on the analogy with the way that pictures represent states of affairs. He thought there had to be some structural similarity, that just as the sentence was made of a sequence of words that stood for things, names, so the arrangement of words in the sentence pi pictured or mirrored the arrangements of objects in the fact. Now this gave him a, a remarkable sort of lever of a metaphysical kind where he could then read off, he thought, the structure of reality from the structure of language because he thought that the structure of reality had to determine the structure of language. Unless language mirrored reality in some way, it would be impossible four sentences to mean. So the crucial point here 
is that we are able to talk about reality not just because we use words that stand for things, but because those words have a relationship to each other within the sentence that corresponds to the relationship that things have to each other in the world. Right. No. So that's what he called the, the, the logical structure. Right. And the world and sentences have that structure in common. Right. But it's important to emphasize now that we're not talking about ordinary language of the sort that you and I are discussing, which he thought concealed the logical structure. He thought if we took ordinary sentences and did an analysis of how they mean, we would get down to the ground floor sentences, what he called the elementary sentences, mm -hmm. and there there would be this strict picturing relation between the structure of the sentence and the structure of the fact. Now, he, in he inherits from Frege the idea that the fundamental unit of meaning isn't the word, but the word only functions, the name only means in the context of the sentence. And as you said, it's the concatenation of the words in the sentence that is itself a fact that enables the sentence to picture the structure of facts in the world. Now, I think people will see quite easily how that can be the case <clears throat> when a sentence is picturing a true fact. I mean, if I say there's a cat on the mat mm -hmm. and there is a cat on the mat, I think the, that relationship is easily understandable. But suppose I say there is no cat on the mat. How can that sort of sentence be said to be picturing right. something? Well, Wittgenstein thought that words like not and 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 or and if, the so-called logical constants, that they actually didn't picture. They were not part of the picturing relationship. As he says, my fundamental idea is that these logical constants don't themselves represent. There are ways we have of stringing pictures together. And it's not so unrealistic if you think about it. Um, uh, for example, across the street from my house in Berkeley, there's a little park and there's a picture of a dog with a line through it. Now, I take it that's not supposed to pick dogs that have stripes painted on them. The, the line is the negation sign, and that's a, it's a Wittgensteinian sort of picture. That is, the, the not symbol there is a way of operating on the picture, but it isn't itself part of the picture. So in, he thought that what we say about the world can be analyzed down into basic sentence structures, basic sentences, which picture the world and are linked together uh, or uh, negated by particular operators. By the, log have, by the so called by, logical constants. By the logical constants yes. which have this function. Right. Now, in my uh, introduction to this discussion, I said that throughout his career, Wittgenstein was concerned to demarcate talk that made sense from talk that didn't make sense. How was that demarcation done in the early philosophy? Right. Well, in the early philosophy, in the, in the Tractatus, Wittgenstein thought, that, Wittgenstein thought that the only language which, strictly speaking, made sense was this fact-stating language. Now, uh, unlike the positivists, he didn't relish that. He didn't think that was wonderful. He thought that the really important things were unsayable, were unstatable. He thought that ethics, religion, aesthetics were in the realm of the unsayable. And he once said about the Tractatus that the really important part of the Tractatus is the part that's left out, the part that's not there at all. 